that difference in color is linked to the titanium content. And so the core runs about 30 ppm titanium and the rim is about 80 ppm titanium. And we did this with laser ablation ICPMS. And so um, the difference in titanium content is also linked to the temperature contrast. And so the hotter it gets, the more titanium dissolves in the quartz. And so this can also be used as a geothermometer to somehow calculate the eruption temperature. And so we did this. This work was published in 2013 with a student of mine, the Titania Quartz Geothermometer. And so um, there's not too many rinds on the lower flow units. You can't really get a great temperature down there, but we have something like 725 centigrade. But up in the higher flow units, we get pretty good results. And you can see there's a general trend of increasing temperature with height in the stratigraphic column. So maybe 820 based on that geothermometer. Uh, there's some earlier data uh, for the Bandler Tuff using magnetite ilmenite and two pyroxene work. And uh, well, you can see that uh, for the lower part, the, the pumice fall, it's about 700 centigrade. And for the uh, last flow unit, maybe 840 degrees centigrade. But the results are more or less comparable for the upper part. It's kind of a nice check on things. And of course, it's state of the art, right? Well, can, another thing that we discovered with our detailed mapping in the resurgent dome is the presence of these breaches in the Bandler Tuff. And so uh, we think they're vent breaches. What you find in a certain restricted area are ignimbrites that have big clots of tertiary sandstone and uh, pre-caldera volcanics, in this case of basalt. Here's another one with a lot of sandstone fragments, and here's one with a basaltic andesite. Here's one with a two pyroxene andesite. You'll notice that most of these things are angular, they're not rounded. Um, and this is a great one. This is Permian sandstone, which occurs at a depth of about oh, 4,000 feet below the caldera floor. So, uh, in, like I say, this occurs in a restricted area. So here's a blow up of our geologic map and the Bandler Tuff is this orange color QBT. It's pretty complicated geology in there, but uh, in these fault scarps, you can see uh, that there's a concentration of this breccia in certain areas of the resurgent dome. Uh, one big area here, there's another area here, though, which is partly masked by a landslide. And so to us, it looks like a vent area, a vent breccia. So here are the characteristics. Uh, the class can be as large as a meter, but typically less than 10 centimeters. They're always angular. You know, they consist of sandstones and argillites, mafic to silicic volcanic rocks, typical of those that predate the caldera. Uh, but we don't find any uh, carbonates or uh, crystalline rocks such as you see in the Precambrian. You know, these are not hydrothermal breaches. I don't know if you've worked on hydrothermal breaches, but they tend to have mosaic textures. They tend to be silicified. Um, we see this elongate outcrop area um, some of the exposures are masked, but one thing about this particular uh, area of breccia is that the ignimbrite host has high titanium and high barium. And so it's actually restricted in this area to what we call the high titanium barium unit. And it's overlaid and flanked by non-lithic rich uh, QBT5U, which has lower titanium and barium. So there seems to be something going on here that indicates some kind of centralized vents, at least for one of the flow units. And again, with chemistry and our uh, ability to you know, map things out now, we have a distribution for unit 4U. Here's the center of the, res of the caldera. And the limit of 4U is indicated by a black dashed line. It's actually quite a small tongue of ignimbrite. You know, the early flow units are sheets, and they occur radially around the caldera. 
they're thick sheets. But these last ones are tons, and uh, they barely make it out of the caldera. Here's the caldera margin. Here's unit 5U. It's a little bigger, makes it out of the caldera. But again, it's a ton. It's not a sheet. And we only find it to the east outside the caldera. It doesn't occur to the north, west, or south. And so we've come up with kind of a modified eruption model for the last flow units of Bandler Tuff. Of course, yellow here is the residual Bandler magma chamber. And what we think is going on is it gets a late pulse of andesite, shown in green. And the andesite uh, shoots blobs or enclaves, if you will, into the Bandler host. And these provide mafic mass, they provide volatiles, and they provide heat to the magma chamber to get it stirring. And so in the case of unit 4U, we see those enclaves appearing in the ignimbrite. They're quite abundant. And they are andesite, quenched andesite blobs. We see very little of that stuff in the last flow units, 5U and 5L, nothing in 4L. It seems to be restricted, though, to an area in the caldera center or, you know, kind of the east center part of the caldera. And, of course, we get flow units of these last things to the east, but they don't occur, for example, to the west. So very restricted distributions. Okay, I'm going to turn our attention now to the timing and duration of resurgence. This was a uh, Argonne-Argonne study done by a student named Phillips, Aaron Phillips, and it was published in 2007. And so just for reference again, this is a DEM photograph. Here's the caldera margin. Here's the resurgent dome, which is about 10 by 7 kilometers. It's a pretty big feature. And then, of course, here are the moat rhyolites or ring fracture rhyolites. And we're going to be talking uh, quite a bit about this one, Cerro del Medio, the first moat rhyolite. We're also going to talk later on about this one, Cerro Santa Rosa. And then last, we'll be featuring uh, El Cajete, the vent right here. It's a crater. And Banco Benito, the last eruption in Valles. But first, resurgence. And so what is a resurgent dome? There's a lot of confusion about that. It's actually the uplifted caldera floor. It's actually a structural uplift. You'll recall that resurgence occurs when the magma chamber beneath the caldera continues to rise and it pushes the caldera floor up in the sky. And so in this case, Redondo Peak, the center of the resurgent dome, is uplifted about 1,000 meters. And so the question is, when did that occur and how fast did it occur? And just to remind you that there are a lot of these tilted lake beds around the margin of the resurgent dome. Um, remember, at the beginning, the caldera depression fills up with water, and so you get lake deposits. And we find these uh, broken sequences of lake beds all around the margin of the resurgent dome. So resurgence occurred when there was a lake, and the resurgent dome rose out of a lake. Here's Cerro del Medio, the first uh, moat rhyolite that's erupted. There's no deformation in this rhyolite. And the date on it from our high-precision argon-argon is 1.229 million years ago. So obviously, the resurgence occurs between eruption of this dome and the formation of the caldera. And, of course, we looked at an age probability distribution. We did laser fusion of 33 sanidine crystals for the Bandler Tuff, and we get a mean age of 1.256, plus or minus 0.01 million years. And for Cerro del Medio, 62 sanidines, a mean age of 1.229, plus or minus 0.017. And these are bracketing the age of resurgence and when it happened. And so, uh, kind of in summary, 
here we are, here's the age for the, for the Bandler Tuff and for Vias. Of course, the resurgent dome rocks are uplifted, tilted, and faulted. Cerro del Medio is 1.229 million, and it is not uplifted and faulted. And so here's the punchline. Resurgence is complete within 27 plus or minus 27,000 years. And I know that looks like a silly age uh, because, you know, the error is as big as the number, right? But what it's really telling you is that this whole process of resurgence it occurs early and it occurs very fast. So fast that it's hard to resolve even with high precision argon argon. But you know, the uplift rate is a thousand, or the uplift is a thousand meters, and the average uplift rate is three centimeters per year. Just a question to you do you think you would feel something like three centimeters a year? Let's say that, let's pretend that you lived in Vias Caldera and you lived on the shore of the lake and uh, something was happening at a rate of three centimeters per year. Do you think you'd notice that if you lived there? Who says no? Who says yes? Who says yes? There you go. That person. And that person's right. Sure you'd feel that because you're lifting something that's seven by ten kilometers, a thousand meters in the air. I mean, three centimeters a year doesn't sound like a lot. That's an inch a year. But for example, that would be a foot in 12 years, okay, so a third of a meter in 12 years. You'd have to feel that because, you know, it would be cracking, the resurgent dome would be breaking, there would be earthquakes. You'd feel that. That's a pretty fast uplift rate. We can compare the uplift rate, rate at Vias, though, to other resurgent calderas. For example, Iwo Jima, Japan. 15 to 20 centimeters per year for the last 600 years. Tana, Vanuatu is 15, 16 centimeters per year for the last thousand years, more or less. Compet Gray is an, a caldera in, unru in an unrest. It kind of goes up and down. They think that magma goes in and magma goes out. It can have uplift rates of 51 centimeters per year. There's a place where that caldera is on the the ocean, you know, near, um, uh, what's the name of the big city there? What's that? Naples, yes, near Naples. And you can see uh, that that area has been uplifting a lot due to changes in the scars of mollusks and other things on Roman ruins. So uh, these things can really happen pretty quick. Yellowstone is about 2.7 centimeters per year for the last 30 years, and so forth. So, you know, the Vias called Dara number of three, that's an average uplift rate for the last, for the, you know, 27,000 year period. And so, resurgence is probably not a constant uplift. It probably has periods where it uplifts quickly and then periods where it doesn't do much. But that's just the average uplift rate, three centimeters per year. Okay, now I'm going to talk about paleomagnetism. It turns out that in the early days of plate tectonics, the Vias caldera played a kind of an interesting role in deciphering some of the ideas that were being developed for of the paleomagnetics of the ocean floor. And so you're aware, of course, that the ocean floor has positive and reversed magnetic stripes. There was a lot of argument about this in the 1960s. What did it mean? And so some of those guys wanted to find a place on land where you could demonstrate reversals of magnetic polarity in some timely fashion. And so let me walk you through this. On this diagram, blue is normal polarity, red is reverse, and purple is transitional. So the Bandler Tuff, which occurs on the resurgent dome, 1.26 million years, that's magnetically reverse. Cerro del Medio at 1.23 is reverse, but Cerro del Abrigo is normal. Here's the big one, Cerro Santa Rosa. It's transitional. It erupted when the magnetic field was flipping. Pretty cool, huh? And then Cerro San Luis and Cerro Seco are both reverse. 
San Antonio Mountain at 560,000 years is normal. South Mountain at 520,000 years is normal. And the latest thing, Banco Manito at 40,000 years is normal. So here's a place where you got these two uh, variations in the magnetic field and one place where the field was actually transitional because it erupted during a uh, time when the field was flipping. This work was published in the late 1960s. And so here's a photograph of Cerro Santa Rosa, the transitional dome at 914 million point, 914 million years ago. This is the north wall of the caldera, so we're looking more or less to, to the south. And this is the resurgent dome of Redondo Peak. So this is the important one. People have revisited this place several times and redated it, taken more samples to try and get more refinements on this particular transitional event. And so if you look at the geomagnetic instability time scale, I say that this is work done by paleomagicians. You can see that there's a big reverse period shown in yellow, the Matayama reverse uh, epoch, I guess you'd say, which uh, you know, flips at about uh, 780,000 years ago. And then we have this big normal, the Bruins uh, normal epoch. But within that, there's the Santa Rosa transitional event. It's a named event. And the Jaramillo uh, normal event. Okay, so it turns out that those events, of course, are named for features in Valles Caldera. Jaramillo Creek runs from the resurgent dome, and it, uh, you know, flows in the eastern part of the caldera. And the Santa Rosa dome is this uh, transitional event. There's also another named event in New Mexico, the Albuquerque reverse, a, a little short reversal in the normal, big normal. This is all summarized in a book, a book called The Road to Jaramillo, published in 1982 by a guy named Glenn. And I don't recommend it as an action novel, but you know, if you're so inclined, you could read it and just you know, see kind of this progression in the history of plate tectonic theory and how it kind of ends up at Valles Caldera in some ways. So I'm going to talk more about the post-caldera rhyolites. There's 25 post-caldera rhyolites, mostly lava domes, uh, flows, and some pyroclastics. Typical erupted volume is about 10 cubic kilometers. The age span is 1.23 to 40,000 years ago, 1.23 million. So if you did the math, you could get a rough eruption frequency of one eruption per 50,000 years. But the dates show that it's highly re, uh, erratic in the terms of the repose periods. I mean, you can't really predict the date of the next eruption, although um, I li lead a lot of field trips through the Vias, and people are always asking me when the next eruption will be. So since the latest eruption is 40,000 years ago and the frequency is 50,000, I tell them the next eruption will be in about 10,000 years. And sometimes they believe me. <laughs> the youngest eruptions are quite diverse. It's called the East Fork Member. It has a lot of pyroclastic material. It has this big ignimbrite called the Battleship Rock Tuff or Battleship Rock Ignimbrite. It's got a lot of uh, pumice fall deposits called the El Cajete Pumice. And it's chemically unique. It's more of a rhyolite, not a high silica rhyolite, such as the Bandler Tuff. <coughs> and the volume of this stuff is a little over 10 cubic kilometers. So it's a pretty big eruption. Um, it's easy to trace these things around the caldera. It's kind of nice that way. And so here's the position of El Cajete Crater in the southern part of the caldera. And these are isopacks in meters, these contours. And so, of, close, of course, when you're close to the vent, the thickness of pumice is about 16 meters or more. But as you get further and further to the southeast, it thins out naturally, and this is a two meter contour, and it actually impinges within the property of Los Alamos National Laboratory, 
which of course is the birthplace of the bomb. I hate to say it, but it's true. And so Los Alamos actually was interested in what the eruption hazard might be for the future, looking at this kind of data. Remember, the next eruption is going to be in 10,000 years. Okay, or it could be sooner. So if you thought about how big an eruption of 10 cubic kilometers is, that Pinatubo is a pretty good comparison. That, of course, occurred in 1991. And if you thought, think about how fast things happen there, they happen pretty fast. You had earthquakes, earthquakes in mid-March of 1991. First steam explosion occurred in April, early April. They forecast an eruption was coming that was successful evacuated a lot of places. First lava dome on June 7th. The climatic eruption, this thing, happened on June 15th, and it only lasted nine hours. But it erupted that much stuff. Okay, it coincided with a typhoon, and so it blew ash and made lahars and so forth. There were 200 to 300 deaths, and of course a lot of impacts on property. Okay, here's the last eruption in the Valles. It's the Banco Benito lava, which is again part of this East Fork member. And again, it's uh, chemically unique. It has an age of 40,000 years ago and a volume of four cubic kilometers. But obviously something like this is not as dangerous, right? Because it's a rhyolite, it's viscous, it's slow moving. This photograph, you can see the nice pressure ridges on top. This is the kind of eruption that the laboratory would like to see if there was one in the future. They don't want to see a pyroclastic explosion. So, in terms of the hazard, Vandler Tuff, an eruption of that scale is highly unlikely, but an El Cajete type uh, pumice fall eruption is possible from the southern caldera we figure that you'd have about three months of warning time based on the Pinatubo example. That was about the same time that was involved with the St. Helens eruption in 1980. So three months, that's long enough to get out of the way, you know, to move to, I don't know, Dallas or something, but maybe not enough time to sell your house. We figure the volume might be as much as 10 cubic kilometers. And the distribution, of course, is highly dependent on prevailing winds, which blows the eruption cloud where it wants to blow it. But based on El Cajete, it could affect as much as 250 square kilometers. The big unknown is when. We don't really know when, but the best way to be prepared for it is to have the caldera uh, instrumentally uh, rigged with seismometers so we can see when that magma starts to move upward. So Vaya still contains an active magma chamber. We know this because there's a big geothermal system that's uh, at depths of 600 to 2,000 meters with a maximum temperature of 342 centigrade. Of course, it's located beneath the youngest post-caldera eruptions. It has a large helium-3-4 anomaly of as high as 6, uh, R over RA. For comparison, more mid-ocean ridge basalt usually has a range between 6 and 10. So Vias is kind of in the low end of that, that uh, scale. There's also a well-defined seismic anomaly uh, at 7 to 15 kilometers depth. So first I'm going to show you the seismic anomaly. And so uh, here, this figure is a block diagram and north is to this direction, to the left. And the scale here is 2 to 39 kilometers. And the warm colors show more seismic attenuation. Of course, a molten body attenuates seismic waves more efficiently than a solid body. And so here you see the magma body, and it stretches from about five to, excuse me, seven to 15 kilometers depth beneath the south part of the caldera where the geothermal system is. That's kind of neat. And here's a map of the shallow temperature gradients. The contours are in degree C per kilometer. And so here's the ring fracture zone for, you know, 
reference. And so the western caldera has these shallow temperature gradients that largely exceed 300 degrees C per kilometer. That's pretty high because typical in most of the world is going to be like 40 to 60, depending on where you are. And of course, here's an area within the western caldera where we get gradients higher than 500 degrees C per kilometer. So obviously magma has to be providing the heat for this. And thankfully we have surface features which verify there must be magma down there. We have these uh, abundant acid sulfate springs inside the caldera with pH less than two and temperatures at the boiling point for that elevation. The gases are rich in hydrogen sulfide and so, and of course it has this high 3-4 ratio of, uh, as large as six. So these things can only be occurring if there's a magmatic heat source uh, providing the, the convection and so forth for that. And of course there's been a lot of drilling in the caldera for geothermal resources. The main reservoir temperature is between 200 and 300 centigrade, but beneath the reservoir we have hit 342 centigrade at 3200 meters. The chloride in the reservoir is pretty typical for volcanic hosted geothermal systems, about 4,000 milligrams per kilogram chloride and TDS of 10,000 milligrams per kilogram. This well, by the way, is a science well we drilled in 1986 to look at the links between uh, the geothermal system and ore deposits and so forth, also to get some data on the depth to the floor of the caldera. We actually hit Precambrian basement in this well at a depth of 5,200 feet, so that would be 1,700 meters, something like this. So although there is a geothermal system, 40 wells were drilled, but they decided they would not develop it because they only proved 20 megawatts. If you hear my talk tomorrow, I'll talk about how big a megawatt is, but it's not that much really, enough for 20,000 people. And right now, of course, the caldera is a national park, so it'll, it'll never be developed now. The alteration style is something we call propolitic. I don't know if many of you have had ore deposit classes, but the mineral assemblage and the altered tuff mostly is quartz, calcite, elite, chloride, epidote, and so forth. It's pretty standard for an epithermal ore deposit. Okay, conclusions. The Bandler tuff, it was formerly thought to be normally zoned. It's the type example of a resurgent caldera. But with our recent work, we've shown that the upper part of the tuff is reverse zoned in chemistry and mineralogy. And the best way to see this is in the chemistry, the titanium and barium in particular. The eruption temperature of Bandler tuff is 700 degrees C at the bottom and ends at about 830 degrees C. The resurgent dome breaches that we found to us indicate that the last ash flow tuff pulses came from central vents, not from ring fracture vents as the standard model portrays. <laughs> the uplift rate is 27,000 plus or minus 27,000 years. I mean, it could be as much as 54,000, I guess. But when you use all the data, the average uplift rate is three centimeters, three centimeters per year, which is not out of line with resurgent uplift rates elsewhere. The ring fracture rhyolites erupted from 1 to 2 million to 40,000 years, and they have this unique paleomagnetic record, which has been used many years ago to verify a lot of plate tectonic concepts. The youngest eruptions are mostly pyroclastic, but we don't see any immediate hazard. Maybe there'll be an eruption in 10,000 years, who knows. There is a residual magma body at 7 to 15 kilometers and it drives this 300 degree C hydrothermal system. So it's still hot, there's still magma, it still could erupt again. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And if you want to, me to answer some questions, please ask away. <laughs>